Um, I'm Moritz, I'm the CEO of Berlin-based hardware company Mitte, and we have one simple goal, which is to replace bottled water. And we do this with uh, this beauty here, um, which help, it's the world's first um, home water system to both uh, purify and then personalize your daily drinking water. And you can create um, cr healthy drinking water at home. So how does that work? That's how it works. Uh, it's the unique combination of purification first, then personalization, and it's all brought uh, together beautifully through connectivity. Let me tell you a little bit about that. So purification first, we can create the purest water on the market. We can take out anything that you would find in the water, from easy things like viruses to very difficult things like hormones or medical residues, or even microplastics. It's increasingly becoming a problem. Secondly, the water gets personalized through our cartridges where the water runs through minerals and then picks up minerals on the way, just like in nature, creating water that's similar to, say, an Evian or a San Pellegrino or any type of water you would want. So we can basically replace your bottled water like that. And the connectivity brings it all beautifully together to the user integrating uh, in the user's lifestyle. We have, uh, we actually now live on Kickstarter. Uh, please support our campaign right now. We have uh, we are two weeks in and had a great success. We are, I think, 280% overfunded today. So please continue that success um, and uh, check it out. Also, just to uh, ease your pain uh, or your worries, we are actually setting up production right now, so we're not one of those Kickstarter projects that will be late. Uh, we are actually in production in Shenzhen in China at the moment. Thank you. Thanks, Moritz. All right, we got to give this over to Michael. This one? Yeah, the clicker, the clicker. Michael, let's welcome out Michael from Forum Labs. Hello, people. All right, two minutes. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael Sorkin. I'm the managing director of Forum Labs in Europe, and it's great to see a couple of familiar faces. Hey, Jenny. Um, uh, Forum Labs is a 3D printing company based in Berlin and Boston, around about 375 people, and um, Looking at the title here, before joining Formlabs, uh, I have been running a company called iGo3D, which was essentially the first um, pioneering company running a distribution service and a promotion in Europe for 3D printing services. And um, when we launched our first retail store in 2013, we had uh, the first visitors, the media, the press, the television coming in, looking at the machines in the store, looking at the flyers, looking back to the machines, looking to me and asking me, hey, where are the 3D glasses? And I was like, which 3D glasses? And they said, yeah, well, the flyer, we want to see the 3D effect, or like in the movies. So they didn't really understand that we were printing tangible objects. They thought that we we're printing on paper. Uh, like in the movies, you can see a 3D movie. So. Uh, that was the perception of 3D printing just five years ago. I joined Formlabs in 2015 where, um, to, to develop and run the European business for them. And uh, last year, uh, my team has done an amazing job and we became the leading desktop 3D printing manufacturing company supplying thousands of machines to designers, makers, car manufacturers, rocket manufacturers, dentists, school teachers, everyone and um, basically changing the way how people innovate around the globe. And um, that success was not being able to be you know, achieved or succeeded without a great team full of passion, drive, um, but basically also a constant thrive to challenge the status quo of the industry. So we were able to change the perception in a couple of years, and I'm really excited to, to meet everyone here today, and also very glad to see a couple of my core team members here in the front row. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Okay, so super excited that so many of you are into hardware. We're gonna assume a base level of understanding because we have 12 minutes and 40 seconds. So we're gonna get right into it. You guys are both in Germany. I don't know if that's saying something about the German hardware ecosystem, but let's start with today when you start a hardware company, can you really be a local business or are you global from day one? And what challenges have you guys learned your early? You guys are much further along. So who wants to start? I can't. Well, I think it, uh, it, it shows that we're actually both not from Germany, that uh, that's a starting point. So I think Berlin is a good place to start a company, but it's not necessarily the best place to start a hardware company. You have, I think you have to be global uh, for, for, for starting a hardware company. 
everyone is a bit different, but usually what you have to do is you try to get funding in the US, you try to produce in, uh, in the Far East, and you maybe do prototyping and leverage the technical expertise of uh, engineers, affordable engineers in Europe. I think that's generally the rule uh, that you would find, at least for us. Yeah, especially talking about hiring, finding the great talents, you know, who understand hardware, such as City, which is full of software and services, Deliveroo, Fudora, Mudora, all this stuff. Uh, rocket internet companies all around the place, and it's very difficult to find the good skill sets who understand that uh, internationally. So you basically, Berlin or such cities, uh, really pull in the people from different countries, different cities, which you are then hiring for to start from scratch and bring it up to, you know, to the rocket size. Just so we know, where is everyone from? Raise your hands, people from Europe? Okay, okay, almost everyone. What about Asia? A couple, down, the North America? A couple, okay, Australia? South America? Africa? Oh, there you go, fantastic. Okay, so big European contingent. Let's talk about sales. So you guys are selling all over the world, world-class sales company, you're on crowdfunding. Couldn't be two polar opposites in terms of stage. But when you look at go-to-market, when you had your business idea or when you decided to build all of your business in Europe for Form Labs, what did you think about from go-to-market backwards? We see that in all the teams we invest in or build. They're really focused on their products. They're really focused on the early stage fundraising. But we don't see many founders that are reverse engineering go-to-market and sales, which we generally find really hurts hardware companies. So how did you guys approach that or how did you think about that when you were starting out? Right. So um, basically, we also started a Kickstarter in 2011. So we had the similar path there. We kind of just launched the product and see how successful it was. It was successful. But uh, when we started in Europe a couple of years ago, we really started from the customer side. We understood uh, the client base. Okay, if we want to target car manufacturers, we really need to speak to them first to understand which kind of standards, which kind of you know approach they are used to have. And then we adopted and adjusted the packaging of the product, the software, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we learned from the mistakes we did at the beginning during the Kickstarter campaign, which is forgiving, by the way. So Kickstarter is forgiving. So don't worry. <laughs> Yeah, I'm a bit afraid already, but I think, I mean, I, I, obviously you want to start from the customer side and you want to, uh, you know, you want to build a relevant product with relevant channels and so forth. I think what what has helped us is that, uh, you know, the founding team, uh, for me, that we have all built businesses before. We have worked in uh, in B2C before, so I think that, that helped uh, to understand a bit. But um, I think what we, all, what we are trying to do now is to go direct to consumer first, uh, to learn, to understand, and then uh, you know, add on other channels. I think it's, it's traditionally what you do, um, and I think it makes sense. You understand first what, 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 how the user reacts to your product, and then you add uh, also according to market. So what next step will be is uh, there's beautiful, you know, those e-commerce uh, platforms like Amazon or Flipkart, or depending on the market that you are in, I think you can add that as a next logical step. And then as a next logical step, you can talk to retailers that understand your business, are also a bit more flexible in margins, and kind of, um, you know, adjust, uh, uh, and kind of adjust to each market as well. I think that's how will be our approach, or that's what we hope to, uh, to have as our approach, uh, but we're not there yet. I mean, right now we're on Kickstarter um, to and get as much uh, you know attraction, uh, attention, and, and traction as possible. So I got to play to the crowd a little bit because almost everyone was from Europe. Let's talk about that for two seconds. So, in Europe, you have a bunch of separate countries, and unfortunately, it doesn't seem like today that any of these European hardware founders are only operating and, and doing their work here. So what is the role of Europe, like you said, or the States or Asia when you're an early stage hardware founder? And does that change as you get larger? I mean, you guys are huge now. So in your early days, you're in Shenzhen. You have raised money from Europe, which is hard. Uh, and I'm sure you're, you're already trying to sell to every country in the world or probably dozens and dozens and dozens, whereas you are already all over the planet. So walk me through early stage mentality, what those regions, like the roles, and then when you get bigger, where do you see that playing out? I <clears throat> so we started in US, in Boston, and we launched the Kickstarter campaign there. That was our primary market where the entire R&D and the development uh, was located. Also our manufacturing, the first manufacturing facility was in US, uh, but not in Boston. 
and over the time, actually, it uh, shifted quite fast. When we entered the European market, we also shifted the production to Europe. So the injection molding parts are being still manufactured in China, obviously, where else? But in, if we go towards um, uh, advanced technology, you really need the skill sets, which you, you know, mostly are able to find from the advanced countries where Netherlands is a 3D printing hub. And uh, we shifted our production to um, Hungary. And Europe started as a really as a sales and a customer service hub at the beginning of the office, but really advanced towards business development. So we're a big portion, let's say 30 to 40 percent of the new product development now. And so we work with the U.S. together on the new products and manufacture them in Europe, but also partially in China or in Asia. I think for us, I mean, we have one. We're not a massive team. We're a team, I think, of 15 people now, but we have one German. So I think that's also, I mean, we have, I mean, some of the people over there, I mean, we have people from Asia, from South America, we have six continents in our team. So I think Berlin, I mean, it's kind of going back to the first point that we have a Berlin, especially, and I'm sure that's also true for other places, Lisbon actually being one of them as well. Europe in, in general is, is a good way of life. And I think, uh, I think it attracts talent, global talent that, that is interested in, in, in that. And it also attracts talent that maybe um, is, 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 let's say, hardware talent, which is a bit different. It's people that usually would work for, let's say, BMW or a Siemens or a GE. And I think that, that that's, uh, that's what, we, what we find now. People are, uh, it's kind of a bit later. Uh, those people are also interested in joining a, a more innovative, a more, uh, you know, like a more creative environment maybe. Um, and I think that's what we see uh, with our team. Uh, and I believe, let's see if that's the case, but I think prototyping uh, makes a whole lot of sense in Europe, or maybe also US, but uh, particularly in Europe, because I think the, the cost with structure is... Sorry? With our machines. Yes. So I, th I think, no, for sure. And I think that that's kind of the next step is that it has become much easier, much cheaper to prototype thanks to the 3D printing, thanks to, you know, um, all the fab labs out there, thanks to all the milling uh, companies and all the, obviously also the, all the accelerators and, and programs uh, like your, your like Brink um, or, or others. I think that has really become much easier to start. It's still very hard. Hardware is hard, but it has become possible to start a hardware company uh, with a small team and uh, okay funding. Yeah, I want to talk about that in particular. So we found both in our team, sounds very similar to you, and I'm sure it's probably your same story, that hardware companies are super diverse very early. They have different challenges from building the company. Forget the hardware part. Forget the product development, manufacturing, all that. But building a company that is almost by definition global from the very first days, even our first investment, uh, Soundbrenner from Germany, was in three time zones, and they had something like six languages in-house within the first 12 or 18 months. Challenging. But we've seen that to actually help them be very defendable. Because there's a durability in going through that work in the early days that most software companies don't have to go through. So what are some of those other tips that you're seeing or you're learning or you've learned in the early days to tell the people that are interested in building hardware companies? Right. I think especially crucial for hardware companies to start thinking very early about the go-to-market strategy and start pulling people who are non-engineers. to just You don't have to hire them. You just have to go out and talk to the market, talk to the people who understand the market. Otherwise, you're risking uh, sleepover uh, the right market penetration time point. So you really like the, the just start thinking or start bringing someone inside the team who understands business. No, I think I think uh, it kind of I can't over uh, like exaggerate the the importance of UX in that sense. I think basically saying how UX or like talking to your user, talking to your customer needs to bring to together the business side and the uh, and the tech side. I think that that is super important because you have such high risk in building the wrong product. You're basically building something for one and a half years, for one a year, whatever. And what if it? What if you haven't talked to the user? What if you haven't like tested it? I think there's a lot, a lot of danger in that. If that you don't involve the users first, and that might be, you know, it doesn't have to be a business person, but you just talk to people and really understand needs and and build according to to, to user needs. I think that's one one thing that that is super important. I think a second thing. I mean, we had a lot of hardware fails now as well. I mean, uh, at least us, you know, we're kind of in that same segment somehow. Chuzero, Tiforia, maybe you guys heard, heard of that as well. But I think the problem those guys also had is they had too much money. They had too much money and they were just like over-engineering like crazy. And they were selling machines 
that no normal person in this world was needing. Um, so I think not having too much money can also be a good thing because you actually need to be very, very careful on how you spend the money and you need to be very, very careful on which components you need, you know, and you can take and maybe you take something off the shelf rather than developing your own, your own things. So I think there's also a danger of having too much money. Um, I got to give it up to anyone that raised their hand from Asia or the team from Africa. We like to call in Hong Kong, we're looking for the cockroaches because those people are going to survive in the hardware game. Having too much money is a real problem. You're completely right when it comes to hardware. Having too little money is also a problem. But. Sure, sure. Uh, so we have a couple minutes left. Let's do this. Everyone out here is excited about hardware. I think all of us believe the future is going to be some version of what we see from building the future of the physical world. What in the last minute and a half are you guys the most excited about right now? It might be a company, it might be a technology, it might be something you see in the, the coming few years, but what's getting you out of bed right now when it comes to building your hardware companies? I think for us it's a very easy answer. In our industry, in 3D printing industry, we're um, meeting so many young, talented people who are starting hardware companies, so where every day is a new challenge, is a new experience, is a new journey we're starting together with the companies, but also uh, meeting great people who will then maybe join our company, and we build nice stuff together, the future. So I think, uh, I don't want to sound arrogant, but I think I'm, I'm very well placed where I am right now, and you know, if you guys want to join 3D Glasses industry, feel free to apply. Love the plug, take it, apply for, <laughs> apply for Formlabs. What about you? Um, I think what I find quite interesting is that I think we will not, in the future, we will see submersive, but we will we'll see companies, I think, that don't do just hardware, they do, don't do just um, software, they don't do just AI. I think what we will see is we'll, be, we'll see a network of things and companies doing network things because you can basically concentrate on one core capability, let's say it's AI, and then actually uh, reach out to people and form conglomerates, uh, maybe even only part-time and build temporary companies maybe even. But I think that's what I see like kind of the like coming together of, of, diff of the different industries and b building real solutions to real problems. And I think maybe, maybe that's how I should have started. I think what we will see is moving a bit away from all those gadgety type uh, hardware companies, or at least that's what I hope, um, to something that really solves problems and really creates value. Not saying that games and gadgets don't create value, but I think we will really see um, f substantial issues being addressed through hardware, IoT, AI, all combined. Practical innovation. Our, so our whole internal motto is unlock the world's data so we can improve life. And that's what you guys are doing. Thank you guys so much. Give these guys a round of applause. And we have two more hardware founders coming up right now, so don't leave. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it.